So I'm Marcia Stefanik, and um, welcome to uh, the Basic and Translational Symposium on Sex Differences in the Sensorium. And I have to confess that I stole this idea from the uh, Stanford Medi Medicine Alumni Association. They did their alumni event last year on the sensorium, and I was so excited about it, I thought, well, what about sex differences? So I want to tell you a little bit about the Wisdom Center. Uh, um, again, I'm Marcia Stefanik. We're co-hosting this uh, with the Wu Tsai Neuroscience Institute, so I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Bill Newsom, William Newsom, and uh, the Neuroscience Institute. But I want to tell you a little bit about Wisdom. So it's the Women's Health and Sex Differences in Medicine Center. Uh, I'm the director. Uh, T.O. Pricing, who you met out in the front, uh, is the Assistant Director of Operations, and Sophie Graham is our Program Associate. So we're a pretty small team, but we do a lot, and I'll talk about that. Uh, we did go through a strategic planning process, and anyone who's gone through that knows that you have to have a vision statement. Uh, ours is Healthy Women and Men, from Conception Through the Life Course. Uh, our mission is advancing human health across the lifespan through research and education in women's health, biology of sex differences, and gender medicine, uh, which is gen generally working against women, by the way, because medicine is mostly about uh, white middle-aged men and, uh, or white rodents. <laughs> and so we really have <laughs> this challenge that we need to learn a lot more about uh, the full spectrum, the full gender spectrum. Uh, and so just to give you a little history, uh, this strategic planning process was initiated by Phil Pizzo when he was the dean at the very end of his time. Uh, and so it was a two-year process to actually put together that vision statement, and you know how long those take, and, and uh, the, the uh, goals. But it was a um, large group, so we had an executive committee and 18 faculty, and then in January th uh, 2013, we were launched. And uh, we kind of had a three-year trial period, and fortunately, the Dean's Executive Committee uh, continued us. Uh, and we are funded by all the departments in the School of Medicine and the Dean's Office. Uh, we have a great website that T.O. Pricing, who's out there, put together. And I just wanted to call your attention to our advisory board, and you can actually read about them. They're all cited here in the leadership. Uh, so we have a very um, excellent advisory board. The names in red are chairs of departments, so we have a lot of support from every department, and that's really our interdisciplinary mission. Uh, we also have representatives from every department, uh, with a few exceptions, and so you can see there's a few photos missing here. Uh, and we actually have a once-a-year seed grant workshop where every department comes and tells us who's working on sex differences within their department, who's doing women's health, and so we get to collaborate and we keep very extensive tables about who's doing what. So we have quite a good inventory if you're ever interested in doing sex differences in any field. Uh, we can connect you to somebody, uh, we hope. Uh, we also have representatives from three of the institutes of medicine, uh, and we plan to get from the other two as well. Uh, so we have a pretty robust uh, educational mission. Uh, we are uh, working on this, the medical school curriculum. Uh, we have a special working group for sex and gender minorities and sexual sexuality. Uh, but also I want you to know that there is a national effort to get sex and gender into the medical curriculum. And what we pretty much have learned is that we have to get it on the, the exam or unless it's tested, no one's ever going to care about it which is unfortunate, but that is a mission. And so I just want you to know that this, there's been uh, two already sex and gender health education summits. One was at the Mayo Clinic and one was at, uh, uh, in Utah a couple years ago, and we have a third one planned uh, for September 11, 13 in Philadelphia. And I'm on the scientific program committee, so I hope that you uh, will go. But it's really for people in uh, the education groups of every school in, in all the schools of medicine and many of the professional health organizations as well. So this is a, a mission to try and get sex and gender into the curricula and on the exams. The other thing I wanted to just bring your attention to is the Office of Research on Women's Health. I'm fortunate enough to be on the, uh, an advisory committee member on that. And we went through a strategic planning process there and came out with our strategic plan for women's health, which you can pull up on 
uh, that website that you see there. We'll be posting all the slides. We're filming all the talks except for our keynote, and they're all on our website, and we actually have a, a decade almost of uh, videos now. And I do want to draw your attention to the NIH policy on sex as a biological variable. This is actually something that if you're writing any new grants, you have to address it. It's a very important thing. And up until this point, review committees weren't quite savvy to it, and they weren't really ranking people down. But rumor has it that as of this year, they really are. And so you do need to be thinking about having males and females, uh, human studies for sure, uh, vertebrate studies for sure. Uh, these are things that are required. And if you don't have both males and females in your study, then you really have to explain why. We don't yet have a non-binary uh, goal, but uh, I am on this advisory committee and I bring it up every time. Um, it is Women's Health, the Office of Women's Health, and so they're a little bit um, trying to figure out how we do that, but we'll get there. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that we have a lot of courses that we've created. Uh, so uh, I'm showing, first of all, the medical school courses, current topics and controversies in women's health. All of these are cross-listed with the undergraduates, uh, sex and gender and human physiology and disease, sexual function and diversity in medicine, and a special queer health and medicine uh, part of that. Uh, sexual assault and relationship abuse, global medical issues, and I want to acknowledge Clea Sarnquist, who is a global health expert who has basically come on board with us to help us develop that program. Uh, we also have uh, some other classes in the undergraduate looking at gender and intersectionality in global health and challenging sex and gender dichotomies in human biology and medicine. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our two big annual events. So this is one of them, uh, Basic and Translational Research Symposium on Sex Differences, which we do every winter quarter. And we have an annual Women's Health Forum every spring. And so to just talk about the Women's Health Forum first, uh, this actually started under the guise of Women's Health uh, at Stanford, which was a program in OBGYN before Wisdom came into being. And I was associate director of that. Uh, and then we just decided once we started our Wisdom Center that we would have these events every year. Uh, so we focused on cancer and survivorship one year, global women's health one year, chronic disease prevention, precision health for women. Uh, and I do think that when we talk about precision health, the fact that we don't even talk about it, men and women, and we talk about the most remote gene, it seems not very precise to me. It's like we could at least get a little bit more pre precision in terms of sex and gender. Obviously, I have lots of ideas. <laughs> so anyway, um, so we also, uh, we for, we foregone, forgot, for, <laughs> we, we chose to forego, I don't know what that word is, uh, chose to forego our um, spring event for a fall event the day the year that Leslie Subach came and this was a very important thing for Stanford so Leslie Subach is the new chair was the new chair she's been here a while now uh, in OBGYN she's our first openly gay chair and I think that that really has launched a lot of the LGBTQ plus uh, activities that we've had but that year we actually did a, f a forum with uh, the Population Health Sciences Center on Gender Matters and why sex and science isn't enough because our current uh, sex as a biological variable still does not include gender, which for those of you who don't know is really the sociocultural factors that influence our biology. So none of us just have biology. Every one of us is being impacted every day by lots of things, but certainly our gender norms impact a lot of things that people call sex differences. And they are biological, but they didn't arrive because of your genes. They arose because of our culture. And so we're trying to get that into um, this uh, scientific mission as well. Uh, we also had uh, prioritizing prevention in women's health. So uh, Kirsten Bibbins Domingo was actually the chair of the US Preventive Services Task Force the year that she was our keynote. Uh, we had, uh, last year we, uh, for our big 10th annual forum, we did uh, women's global health and had one of the leaders in uh, gender-based violence, uh, Mary Ellsberg, presented then. And I just want to let you all know that we do have a program uh, lining up for May 13th on sexual and gender minority health, uh, which we're doing in partnership with the Department of OBGYN. And you can see that we generally partner 
Um, we're very interdisciplinary and we find that partnering is really the way to go. Um, we also have the Basic and Translational Research Symposium on Sex Differences, which this is uh, today. Uh, this started actually before, uh, again, we were funded, uh, but I was very active in the Cardiovascular Institute for the Women's Cardiovascular Program, and so we started our first two uh, Sex and Gender Beyond X and Y Symposia uh, in the Cardiovascular Institute, and then the Wisdom Center took it on, and we had neuroscience, we had immunology, we had cancer and sex-specific cancers, we had cardiovascular disease, we did neuroscience in 2017, uh, again in partnership with the Wu Tsai uh, Stanford Neuroscience Institute. Uh, Mike Snyder said, I want you to do genetics, and uh, the best that we could come up with was X and Y, so it was YX uh, and sexy chromosomes. So uh, if you're not aware, the X chromosome is absolutely amazing, and I do want to point out that it is not a female chromosome. There's not one human being alive today that doesn't have an X chromosome. It's really important in human health. And uh, if you ever do GWAS, uh, genome-wide association studies, you may not be aware that they often don't include the X and the Y chromosome because just like everything with women's biology, it's too complicated. Um, but it's, it is actually very important for men. It's very important for all people, this X chromosome. Uh, and so we had some experts on human X chromosome. Uh, last year we did, uh, we, we partnered with the Maternal Child Health Research Institute and did uh, uh, some, uh, our symposium on sex differences from conception through puberty. Uh, and then today we're going to be doing the sensorium. And we have some great experts on vision, hearing, smell, vestibular uh, touch, and uh, touch of sensuality. We'll get to that. And as, as you know, we're doing this with the Wu Tsai Stanford Neuroscience Institute. And I just want to let you know that next year, uh, we are going to do again with the Wu Tsai Institute a sex differences in pain. Pain was actually too big to just have one talk. It really deserves its entire symposium. So next year we'll be doing pain. And I do want to also let you know that we have a fall program planned uh, together with the Pop Sci program, population science program in the Stanford Cancer Institute and the Population Health Sciences Center uh, on cancer. So we're going to do sex specific and sex differences uh, on September 29th. So we've got our calendar loaded. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and move us into our program. I think we're right on time. <laughs>